Today on The State of Us, the cost of living is rising or falling, trying to save for a down payment and retirement at the same time. Are Americans better off today than they were in 1980? Two conservative thinkers are at odds over this question, according to a review in the Wall Street Journal. We're going to take a look at what both of those conservative thinkers think uh, and also discuss how trying to save for a down payment and retirement at the same time can complicate matters. Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only, your friendly redneck liberal and the senior resident historian here at TrueChat, Mr. Lance Jackson. So we're going to think about how the thinkers think. Well, actually, that, you, that was really good. If you want to be real specific, we're going to think about how the thinker thought about the thinker one and thinker two. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss episode. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I read it, and I'm not. I am not sure who I agree with. I have. My feelings, I think the one guy's trying to be a little bit rosy, but um, let's go ahead. I don't know. And I know, you know, anecdotally, a couple people who are struggling with that, well, I need to start saving for retirement, but I'm trying to save for a down payment for a house. So which one should I do? That's a tough one. Can you do both? Well, it depends, right? I mean, that's part of what we're going to talk about today is uh, it... It depends. So let's take a look at the first uh, conservative thinker and their sort of philosophy on how to look at this. Basically, in 2020, uh, Oren Cass, who is a executive director of the American Compass, which is a right of center policy group, unveiled a measure that's called the Cost of Thriving Index. Basically, the thinking here is that the hallmarks of the middle class American dream have soared housing, a college education, transportation and health care. Um, and while it's true that inflation adjusted wages are higher than before, because those other things have gone up non-proportionally, it complicates getting access to these things. Put simply, his basic conclusion is that in 1985, OK, a single income family. Note what I said there. A single income family could afford the basic trappings of middle class life, food, housing, health care, transportation, and their children's college from working 39.7 weeks at the median wage for men aged 25 and older. In 2022, that median wage would now take 62 weeks of work to afford those same things. This measure of the cost of thriving yields a 36% decline in the standard of living since 1985. So simply put, he's saying wages have gone up, but what it takes to live the middle class life, those expenses have outgrown wages. And now... 40 weeks versus 62 weeks, hence two income homes if you want to reach middle class status within median wages, which, you know, I'm not even going to get you down that rabbit hole of median and everything else and, you know, you get mode. Me, get me excited. All those kind of good things. But- but then, simply put, he's just saying it's gotten more expensive to live, even though wages have outgrown and to pay for the other things in life. But you could argue then, right, that, OK, so it's gone. It's 30 some percent more, you know, 40 weeks to 62. But hey, you got two people working so you can still get there. So what's your complaint? I mean, OK, so. <clears throat> Mom doesn't get to stay home. The kids are more anxious. Now, I don't know. That's, I don't want to. Use it. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's only a 36% decline in the standard of living. Well, but it's not because how many people actually live in a one income? 
well, situation isn't part of the point, though, that you can't afford to if you wanted to. And that's a good and that's the, the I mean, that's the other way of looking at it. Right. It, For, it is a change in how we live. But it's also a question of, well, do we want to live that way? Because that's a very fair point as it is measuring a single earner. So the truth is that if you want to be a single earner, right, or you want to live in a single earner household, because that's not those aren't the same thing. Right. I mean, that's (laughs) that's that's a very important measure here, too. If you were a single earner and did not have somebody to help you raise your kids who was staying home, that changes this equation drastically. (laughs) <laughs> because now your cost of childcare is going to go up astronomically. But even if you're in a single offset. earner and want to live by yourself, right? You still can't make it. Correct. I mean, you're still going to be in that. Even if you take out, you know, the childcare costs, the same is still true about the other items. It might not be exactly a 36 percent decline, but it's the same. Unless sort of you thinking. work 22 weeks of overtime, right, throughout the year, and then okay, so you have the money to be able to afford the trappings of middle class that but somebody you're not, could have afforded with 40 weeks of work. Right. But you're not in enjoying it. So you can still get there according to him. Right. But you're going to have to work 22 weeks of overtime. So then you don't have any time to enjoy all the things that you could then afford. Right. And then like you said, if you have somebody at home and have kids, that's different as well. But what if you just want to live by yourself? Sure. He, he, you, his numbers say you can't achieve that. Not without. You, you can't do that. Right. Not with. Well, yeah, you can't do it. Any, I mean, the whole point is you say, well, why do the week numbers matter? Well, how many weeks are there in a year? There's 52. Right. So what they're saying is on a year basis, in order to, in order to do what you would have done in 1985, you have to work 62 weeks. Well, how are you supposed to do that? So I guess I'm mistaken, right? 10 weeks of overtime. Right. But. But and take no vacation. And, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, ten weeks of overtime and no vacation, right? And in 1985, you could have uh, 12, 12 days, twelve weeks of vacation, right. and, and still afford everything. Obviously, you weren't necessarily taking twelve weeks, but that goes back to the wealth. Oh, building and then you component. could save for college, <laughs> and you could save for the new car, right? And you could save for a better house. Well, because if only forty weeks of the year were spent, because accounting of your for paycheck cost, was yours. Right. What do you, what do you want to do with it? Right. Other than just take care of all the basics. Right. You know, that's a huge, I mean, that's, that's a massive difference, you know, in terms of the disposable income that remains, um, in 1985 versus now, if we use, and this is the big contention today, right? Folks is what measure do you want to use? Cause this is just one of them. In the other corner of things is Scott Winship of the American Enterprise Institute, also a center-right think tank, who released a paper this week correcting and rejecting the cost of living index. Winship is arguing that using better measures of inflation and accounting for lower federal taxes shows it is easier to thrive than before. Important to note, though, that this is not your standard like left versus right debate. Cass, who was the first person we talked about with the uh, cost of thriving index, Right. He actually was the domestic policy director for Republican Mitt Romney's presidential campaign in 2012. And Winship was the Republican selected executive director of the Congress's Joint Economic Committee under Senator Mike Lee from Utah, who's a Republican. So these are two these are two well-known conservative Republican thinkers, right, who are disagreeing about what the reality is from 1985 to today. On education, Cass uses the price of room, board, and tuition at in-state college for two children spread across 16 years of saving. Winship counters that most families, in fact, don't pay the sticker price. After accounting for financial aid, the average year at state colleges costs $14,560 per child, according to data Winship cites from the college board. You go on to housing, Cass uses the rent of a three-bedroom apartment in Raleigh, North Carolina, as representative of a median U.S. city. Winship says this is barely relevant for homeowners who mortgage payments include principal and who own an asset that is often appreciating, their net expenses end up much lower. I want to pause on this one, the housing, because I feel like we've talked about this a lot on the show, and I think it's a super, not that these other ones aren't important, right? Like I'm not discounting 
the education, healthcare, um, or transportation arguments. Those are substantial costs, but where you live, you know, and what type of living arrangement you have for most people is their single biggest expenditure. Mm -hmm. You know, the single biggest budget item you have is your domicile, you know, whether, whether you it's your rent or your rent. mortgage. Right. right. So this one's really important because this one greatly impacts, it impacts everything else more than all of the other items. And I guess I would say that here, the important thing to understand, right. And we've talked about this before is, um, the home ownership rate among millennials, right? Just recently, I mean, as in like this year, 2023, right. Millennial homeowners have finally outnumbered renters of their generation, but it just changed and they still aren't catching up to baby boomers. Approximately 52% of millennials, typically defined as those ages 27 to 42 this year, owned a home by the end of 2022. The number of millennial homeowners hit 18.2 million in 2022, going, growing by 7.1 million in the past five years alone. Despite the progress, though, baby boomers are still the largest share of homeowners in the U.S., with 32.1 million owning their own homes, nearly double the rate of millennials. So the important thing here, right, is millennials are, ma are they're, they're making headway, especially the past five years in particular. They've made a lot of headway in purchasing homes. But we did a show not long ago, Lance, and you'll remember that the age at which they're getting into their home is substantially older than baby boomers. Well, and it's, that isn't even taken into account. How do you save the money up to be able to buy a home? Right. Because in, in most cases, you're going to have to have 20% down and you're going to have to pay the closing cost. You're talking about a big chunk of change just to get into a home, much less, you know, making the mortgage payment. I mean, it's- And we've make, talked about adjusted making the rents. Mortgage, making the mortgage payment's not the problem. It's coming up- With the down payment. With the down payment and the closing costs and the moving expenses. That's where millennials, it seems to me, are hitting the roadblock because- Well, on the, higher rents. The college debt, right? Well, and rents are higher because there's a housing shortage in the United States of where people want to live. Now, you may look down your street and three out of the five houses are for sale. You know, there's plenty of room, but is anybody wanting to live there? And where the millennials are, where the job, going where the jobs are and where they want to live, there are housing shortages. And so therefore rents are going up. And to your point, as you're trying, I think you're trying to say is if you're paying more in rent, then you have less disposable income to save for the down payment to buy the house. A Harris poll found, Lance, that about 61% of people feel priced out of the current real estate market as of December 2022. Uh, that jumps to 69% among millennials, okay? And more than half, 56%, believe that the dream of owning a home is dead, according to the survey. So this is, again, I don't think it, it can't be overstated how important this this particular component of what they're both looking at, and I think they're both missing the mark here in the analysis, there's not enough stock being given to the nuance of home ownership and cost of rent. Because to your point, Lance, it matters a lot how much you're spending on rent to how much you can save to how long it takes for you to buy your home. So it's great to say that, you know, well, over half of millennials now own homes. Okay. But when baby boomers still own the most of any generation, you know, and when well, but that makes sense, so whoa, 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 you, you're 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 big into this causation and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, baby boomers own most of the homes. They're older. They've had a they've had more time oh, to do it. Own homes at a higher rate at the same age, I guess. As I should. Well, be but you didn't. Specific. Did you give us anything? You didn't. You didn't give us anything that said what was the millennial or the boomer rate at 26 to 42? That's a great question, Lance, and it's one that we will answer when we come back.
Is the cost of living rising or falling? Well, we decided that one of the central questions to being able to fundamentally answer the question about are millennials better off than their parents were, while these two, you know, highfalutin, respected, conservative thinkers have come up with different ways of answering that question. One says yes, one says no. We're trying to parse how they came up with this information. One of the big areas they disagree on is housing, right? So the cost of thriving index bases their housing projections on the rent of a three-bedroom apartment in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is representative of kind of the median U.S. city. On the other hand, Winship says that that's not very relevant because 52% of millennials, they own their own homes. So that doesn't matter to them. So it, it brings up this fundamental question, right, of, well, what, how much do rents impact the cost of living and what are the home ownership rates? And where we left off at the last of the, end se- the last segment was basically Lance posing the question of that we haven't talked about, that Justin has been a terrible host so far and has not yet explained what the percentage rates of ownership are at the same age Millennials versus baby boomers. And also rents, median rents. We need to look at that too, right? Because the equation is not as simple as, well, what are you paying for rent or what are you paying for a house? You have to talk about both and see what those differences are. 62% of millennials who are 40 years old owned their own home. That's compared to almost 70% of baby boomers at the same age. Okay, so an eight percentage point difference at the same age when they were 40 when, it, when each group was 40, those are the percentage rates. So there's what you need to know about that. That's Forbes.com, by the way, reporting that information. And then let's talk about rents. In 1985, inflation adjusted to today's dollars, okay, so that we're doing a one-to-one comparison because that's important. We don't want to talk about 1985 rent and 1985 dollars. It's going to sound worse than it is. 1985 rent in today's dollars, the median rent was $693.55 or 700 bucks. Okay. 1985. In 2021, which is the year which that is most recently available for, it's about $1,200 a month in today's dollars. Almost twice. Almost double. <clears throat> rent has right. almost doubled. In and the that's last adjusted for inflation. 40 years. Right. Right. So here's, here's what you have. Median rent, right, has nearly doubled for boomers versus millennials at the same age. Median rent has nearly doubled. And there is a, a basically about an 8%, 7 to 8% spread, percentage point spread between home ownership at age 40 for boomers versus millennials. So decisively, we can say now whether or not this means they're better off or not is a different question, but we can decisively say millennials on average, and there's that terrible thing that I don't like average on average will pay more for rent and own homes at a lower rate than baby boomers do at the same age at the same point in life. So then we'd have to agree with the first gentleman that, I mean, that's what I'm leaning towards, I guess, agreeing with the first gentleman, that it is harder to achieve that middle class status because, I mean, I can't, I, I can't, I can't imagine it because I talk to my daughters all the time, but their rent payment is stopping them from doing a lot of things, and it's something that I personally couldn't relate to because that wasn't the case when my wife and I were married and, you know, had been married for a couple of years in 1985 and were, you know, renting apartments, we were still able to save money to be able to buy a house. The numbers you just shared shows that it's twice as hard for my daughters as it is for me. And we're not even talking about, and I know that we don't have these numbers, but what's the median price for a home? Yeah. You know, so, I yeah. mean, we're talking about it's twice as hard to save money because, you know, $600 more a month is going towards rent cost adjusted. In today's dollars. Right. In today's dollars than, than when I had. Because I'm like, I'm getting ready to look at you and like, no, Justin, I was paying, 
you know, $250 a month for a two bedroom apartment. You're actually spot on, by the way, just, I mean, in total deference to Lance, I did not share those numbers with him, but the median rent in $1985 in 1985 was $255 a month. Yeah. That's what I was paying. And if we can, if we put today's rent in $1985, it would have been about $440 a month. Right. And And I was, and I was making 375 an hour. Yeah. But I could make that, pay- you know what I'm saying? And, right. And I got jobs and I've got better jobs. But if jobs you had had to make a rent payment, I mean, my guess is if you had seen apartments that were priced at $440 a month. I wouldn't have month, looked at them. You, those would not, no. Like, no, I can't, those are not We first in- got married, that was right. a fairly nice neighborhood in a building yeah. where we could afford. It was a median. Yeah. You know, and, and it was okay to take my my new bride, you know, to, to live there. Right. And, and neither family was, thought I was taking her to, you know, a really bad place or a dangerous place to live. Um, and it was within a mile of where I was going to finish up going to school, you know, but I wouldn't have been able to do it right at $450, $500. I wasn't looking at apartments like that. We wouldn't have been able to pay the mortgage or excuse me. We wouldn't have been able to pay the rent, but we could at that. And then we could set aside money to finish school, which led us to better jobs, which gave us more money to save that we could put towards buying a house. And it wasn't easy. None of those moves. I mean, we get out the old picture books when we first moved into the house where we live now, and which was our first house and only house we've ever had. The furniture is just, and you look at the rooms, there's nothing in them. We were rattling around in that house and we scraped together every penny we had to be able to buy that. You know what I'm saying? And so it's not like, well, yeah, we were just rolling in the money, but as a boomer, you can't, I feel like we can't look at the millennials and say, well, you need to work harder. You need to save better. You need to be better with your money. That's just not the case, people. It's more expensive and it's harder for them to get to that median level because costs have gone up, even though they're making more money than we ever dreamed of at their age, it's not going as far for the main expenditures. One of the, I think, important points of the article, because we only touched on this earlier, but it's, it's, I think, super important, is it's worth noting that in 1985, families with two spouses working full time were not nearly as common as they are today. A metric that's based on a single earner family will partially reflect that a single earner today faces increased competition from two career families who contribute to driving up the prices and expectations Mm -hmm. of what a middle class life means. Yep. Winship also points out that single earner family with two kids in Cass's example would have a lower tax bill today than they did in 1985. Altogether, Winship is claiming that single th- that the single earner family is between four and fifteen percent better off today than they would have been in 1985. But again, that's the here's where it's this is why it's so difficult to just blanket statement. You know, on the whole, I think I'd be comfortable saying that millennials, on average, right are having a more challenging time. But are there millennials who are having an easier time? Yes. Are there millennials who are having a much, much harder time? Yes. And a big part of that depends on, are there two earners or one earner? Because the other component there they touched on, which again, like they just briefly mentioned it, but it's a huge thing. If you have two people earning two incomes, what are your expectations of what a middle-class life is supposed to look like versus if only one person was making money. That's true. I mean, that's, that is a fundamentally very big difference to how you're going to perceive what you want to have access to. If you have one income at $40,000 a year versus two incomes at $80,000 a year, what you think you ought to be able to have access to is going to be pretty different. You know, the person who lives alone and makes 40000 a year probably is not going to imagine that they should have everything that a two earner household with $80,000 has. But when you have those two earner homes, right, whose incomes are combined, they're then raising the expectations and you're also squeezing out single earners 
Sure, because, because then, uh, well, because you're way more competitive. I, I can ask for more for my house because there's somebody out there Absolutely. who's going to pay for it. Yep. Because they're making the extra money because they have two wage earners. And if you only have one, where's that house available for you to even buy? Well, we were giving our producer a hard time over the break about, you know, this whole notion of the the money equation of relationships. But it's very true. I mean, I'll be the first person to admit that I would not have what I have today if my husband and I weren't. Now, we weren't married then, but our finances were combined. We couldn't get married. So that was you know, right. a thing. But but we would not have what we have, either of us, if we had not gotten together when we did and put our finances together when we did. Because I I probably still would not, I might just now own my own home, but I've had my own home now for five years, right? Well, I, if you rewound five years and you and he wasn't in the equation and I had to do it on my own, there's there's no one that would have given me a loan to get a home because I I mean I wouldn't have even looked for one because there's no way that on what I was making then I, that I that that would have even been a possibility you know what I mean couldn't couldn't have done it well and see my wife and I were together at 21 and 19 and we've always both worked from from the from that very and then, young age right we're we're talking about in 1985 that that's not so that we, wasn't the most common right, thing and so we were dual so you, wage earners. That the helps. first five or six years. Quite a bit. Right? When right. we could save money I mean, to buy smart. our first house. It's smart. But I guess that's, I guess. But that was a change in, like you said, we were not the norm. Right. For both of us to be working. Because the norm was not, not for that. Right. St- or the norm wasn't for both people to work full time. We shouldn't say that right. both people didn't work. 1985, it was not unusual for somebody to work. And we didn't start our, and we didn't start our family right away. We didn't job. have any childcare. We didn't have any of those costs. Which either also would be unusual. Because we didn't, you know, we didn't have, yep. we didn't have children until we'd been married, you know, five or six years. Yep. It's the fundamental, what I'd like to see somebody do, Lance, is kind of come up with the, the formula for success for people today. Because- even if, even if, the, but I think it's so much of it matters to what's your situation. Well, that's what I mean. What's your schooling? What's your salary? But we ought to have a thing what's that your, says, you know, if if you just want to do things based on. But does that matter? Because the author of that article even says, I agree with the second guy that things are easier. But now that I have a three year old child and I'm making a mortgage payment, I have a hard time. I lie awake at night <laughs> figuring out how I'm going to pay for diapers, how I'm going to feed my new child, and how I'm going to pay for their college. So, does it really matter if we figure it out and there's some algorithm or there's some chart out there that says, well, you should be happy because this is where you, you fit in and this is, does it matter really if that's, if we find that out or does it matter what's, inside our soul and inside our brain as to whether or not we're happy and we're satisfied. Would, would, and does that then too depend on your own personality? That are you striving to be the median, to be like everybody else, and once you get there, you're happy? Or are you happy where you are because you've gotten there and that makes you happy? Because you're doing it. You're doing what you wanted to do. That's a great question, Lance, and it's one that we will answer when we come back. I would encourage folks, if you've not ever looked it up, uh, to look up uh, Nightbird's initial audition on America's Got Talent. This was in the middle of the pandemic, um, and she said after her audition when she explained um, you know that she didn't offer this up at first but you know through the questioning the judges found out that uh, she the reason she hadn't been working for a couple years and had been struggling financially was because she had had cancer Um, and they wanted to know well how are you now and well I have cancer in my brain and my spine and in my stomach you know and so not not very good (laughs) you know like yeah there's a two percent two percent survival chance is what the doctors had told her right um and she's actually, she's passed away now, but she said at the end of that interview, and this is what I thought of while you were speaking, Lance, is you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Should we do things about this? Yes. But a big part of it's also our expectations from the onset, right? 
if we're saying, well, I need this and I need this and I need this in order to be happy, are we going at it the wrong way? Or should we say, well, I have this, I have this, I have this, so I am happy. It doesn't change that both of them are backing into this through the, through the equation of, well, in order, to, in order to be successful, in order to be happy, you need X, Y, Z. Well, who says that you have to have those things to be happy, right? right? Well, I mean, it's that age-old philosophical question, you know, freshman philosophy class, they bring in a, a glass of water. And they ask everybody in class, is the, cl- is the glass of water half full or is it half empty? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? You know, don't let other people, I guess that's my big takeaway. Don't let other people dictate whether or not you're happy. Because if you like your life and you like what you're doing, wonderful. If you don't, then you've got to figure out how you're going to get to whatever it is that's going to make you happy. But that's the other thing is you have to know what that's going to be. Because if you're just out there chasing happiness and you don't know what it is until after you found it, then maybe you'll never find it. Well, and I think part of that, though, too, an important part is reflection, which is something that in we don't spend a lot of time. When I say we, I'm talking about the younger generations, millennials, Gen Z. Historically, we don't spend as much time reflecting. And there's a reason that reflection is important because it's that component that provides the opportunity for perspective which is exactly what you're talking about, Lance, of you may have discovered something that makes you happy and not even know it. Because if you don't ever take any time to ask yourself, well, what do I have? Or it's never been taken away from you. Right. If you've never lost it, you know, then you don't know that. Right. Oh, wow. This is really making me happy. That can be said of everybody. Right. But I think it's one of those things we all, mindfulness is, is, is a big term, you know, that's, that's mentioned a lot nowadays, but mindfulness of what do you have? How far have you come rather than what we always, well, how much further is there to go? Yeah. You're always chasing something out there. Why not just, as you said, I like reflection. Look at what I have. Look where I've come from. Look, look at the people I have in my life. One of my favorite things to do when I, when I want to reflect is I, I I say to myself, if you pick I, up a John Adams book. And- <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that that helps too. But um, I I I say, you know, if I could rewind five years, right, or ten years, you pick whatever you want. But usually for me, it's five years. If if I could rewind five years and tell me from five years ago, right now, here's what your life is going to look like in five years. That that Justin would have laughed me out of the room because there's like not, I mean, save one thing. I'm not doing anything that I was doing basically five years ago, except for this show, which we're talking about right now. And we're not in the same location that we were then. We were not on radio back then. Like, I mean, very, there's a lot of components. Our producers are not the same as they were five years ago. None of them, you know, I mean, really the only thing that's same is that Lance and I are still sitting here. This table's not, I mean, you know, it's all those things of if I had sketched out, if you'd asked me five years ago to tell you what my life was going to look like in five years, what it looks like right now is not what I would have told you. And, and I, and not in a bad way, you know what I mean? I'm very thankful for what I have, but that's a, it's a good way to remind yourself of that of, well, if you had asked yourself five years ago, where were you going to be? You know, are you pleased or not pleased with where you are? And if the answer is you're not pleased, then what do you, what do you need to do to become pleased. And if the answer is, well, gee, I guess I, I am pretty happy with where I'm at because I w- would not have said this is where I was going to be. Then you have, you know, you have more of, I guess, the answer that matters a lot more than whether or not factually. Some, some metric tells you. Right. The metrics tell us that, yes, it is, it is harder, um, you know, for the millennial generation than it was for their parents at the same age on average. However, We also know, because how many shows have we done, Lance, where we've explained what matters to millennials is not the same as what mattered to their parents on average. So why why are we measuring- Why are you trying to define happiness from one generation for that- another generation has to meet those same goals? We're defining the classic trappings of wealth in the American system by the standards of 40 or 50 years ago. Is it time to update the standards? Because, or one of two things, either update the standards and then decide if we're meeting those standards 
or we need, or we should make the standards more achievable. Decide what you want to, what you, what is going to make you happy and what your success is going to be. Because for example, if, if money's not the main, you know, driving force in your life, this whole thing of like, well, you got to buy a home. No, I mean, not really. If, if you're not super interested in having kids, or if you have kids, you're not worried about paying for their college. If that, if all those things are not something that's important to you, you know, then this whole notion of, well, you need to have this house to build this wealth, to build this equity for this retirement. Why well, don't want to retire? Well, well, then how do we measure that you're, you know, whatever? I mean, it, it totally blows those things out of the water if you remove certain goals from the equation. Exactly. So I, I got to do what's right for you. Yeah. You have to set up what your success equation looks like and then decide if you're meeting those things rather than saying, well, do I meet the equation of success as predetermined? You know, well, do I meet, am I doing as well as my parents? Well, your parents wanted to have a single family home in a suburb. Why well, want to have a penthouse apartment in downtown New York? I, yeah, I, and I don't want to have any kids. And they wanted to have three kids and they wanted to pay for their kids college. Well, I don't want to pay for my kids college because I'm not going to have kids and they're married. Well, I don't want to get married. I, I mean, the, how, how is it that those, you can't, you can't compare that, apples and oranges. Right. And it's not that one did better than the other. And it's not that one it, is better it, or one's worse. But it, to say that, well, now this person, you know, this person by these people's standards isn't doing crap, you know, well, vice versa could be said the same thing. Well, they're, they're screwing out and getting, wasting all their money on those darn kids in their college, you know? Exactly. Well, not for them, because but for you what, they are. Because that's what they wanted. Right. If you want different things. We should all be accepting of that. So why we have this conversation today, Lance? There was a reason. Um, I'm told. Really? I didn't there know There has that. been for the past 12 years, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, because we work at a place called the True Chat. The reason has changed some over time. Yeah. Well, not really. Well, no. yeah, even this has even changed. This. I remember. The, even this. The, the original, original one was a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Justin was wordier. And then we- He had more to say. Got and it pared he's, down. He's learned um, that- True Chat's mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And hopefully you've enjoyed today's show. You tell people about it. They want to listen. Tell them they can find us as a podcast on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us releases new episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays. See, there's another thing that's changed. Day of the week. Oh my God. I think we've done... I think we've done pretty much every day. Of the every week. day. I, I don't think Sundays though. Sunday is not a release day. Well, it is for the radio. It is true. So we're <laughs> and we've recorded on every day. We're of the week, on. So that's right. I, we're we're available seven days a week somewhere. <laughs> that's right. Yes. At some time, you can hear us seven days a week. And when we recorded the shows, anybody's guess. But right now, you can get new episodes. New episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays, first thing in the morning. Um, as a podcast, those same episodes are heard on the weekends at all different times across all different stations across like half of the states in the U.S. So, you know, check them out. <laughs> For the State of Us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer Levi LaForge and senior producer Bradley Butch. And thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.